Okay, so uh, in this lesson we are going to talk about uh, one solution to the internet scalability issue, uh, so the internet uh, domain routing problem, uh, which is uh, the locator ID separation protocol, which is an evolutionary internet architecture. So it's not aiming to replace what we have today, but it is aiming to build on top of what we have today to try to address this issue. So, as we recall from the uh, previous lesson, so uh, we are having uh, scalability issues on the internet with routing tables. Um, and the main reason behind this is not that the internet is becoming very large, but uh, is that we have uh, many issues with multi-homing and traffic engineering practices. That this is uh, um, be, uh, adding a lot of entries into routing tables. So what we need actually is a better implementation of uh, multi-homing and traffic engineering. And this is what actually is trying to solve LISP. So as we also discussed, there are clean slate solutions with aim, aim to replace what we have today and to start from scratch. And then we have evolutionary solutions, which they aim to re-implement what we have today, uh, not, re not throwing away the uh, current internet architecture, but to try to build on top of it. And at least the locator ID separation protocol is one of these solutions. So, um, um, in this lesson, I'm going to explain very, very briefly how LISP works. And uh, I will leave some of the details for you to look into this, the, the slides or to read uh, the, the documents that uh, I'm suggesting. So, uh, LISP is an open standard um, published by IETF, so any, anybody can implement LISP. And actually, many people have done that. We have LISPMOP, uh, which is an open source um, Linux implementation, then we have Cisco, which is also uh, has implemented LISP on their uh, equipment, then OpenLISP, which is a FreeBSD free implementation, and then, for instance, uh, OVM, which is a German company which is building home routers that they also support LISP. So LISP is widely deployed. Um, there is um, uh, an experimental network uh, worldwide, uh, which uh, points of presence pretty much around the world, and with many companies and academic institutions uh, interested in too. So this is not just an architecture, it's, it's a reality. Okay, so which are the design principles behind this? So uh, one of the biggest and most important things to understand about LISP is that it splits the IP addresses into two sets. One, they are called EADs, endpoint identifiers, and the other ones are called uh, error logs, routing locators. In both cases, they are both IP addresses, either IPv4 or IPv6. But uh, an IP address will be either an EAD or an airlock. It cannot be the, the two things at the same time. EADs are responsible of identifying the identity of a node, while airlocks are responsible of locating the node. Okay? So if you think about an IP address, it has two meanings in the current internet. It is both the identity of the node, so it is unique, but it is also the way that we use to reach that node, so it's actually its location. So you cannot change the location of an IP address without changing the identity. And this is precisely what this piece is doing. It is splitting those two, um, those two very different things, which is identity in loca and location, into two different sets of addresses. So with this, you will have either an EID, which is an identity, or uh, an IP address, which is an airlock, which is the location. Okay? So, another important aspect of LISP is that it is considered an open architecture, which means that it builds on top of the internet. So, you deploy LISP on top of what we have today. You don't need to replace anything, you don't need to uh, throw away anything. We have an internet today, which is working. We cannot scale it further, but what we can do is deploy something on top of it and make it work better. And if you think about it, this is actually what happened with the current internet. We had, before the internet, we had a worldwide network, which was the public uh, telephone network. And it worked. And when we deployed the internet, we didn't uh, throw away the, the telephone network. What we did is to deploy it on top of the telephone network. So LISP has a similar idea. Another important aspect of LISP is that it has a decoupled data and control plane. Data plane is responsible of forwarding packets as fast as possible. And the control plane is responsible of controlling how this forward is performed. And at the end, there are two different things. They have different requirements, and as such, um, list the couple of them. This is also a principle which is very uh, common nowadays in the uh, SDNRM. And finally, list um, uh, 
tries to have something which is called incremental deployability, which is that you, you don't need a flag day that everybody goes Lisp in order to have some of the benefits. On the, other, on the contrary, Lisp aims to uh, be able to interoperate with the legacy internet so that some people can deploy Lisp, um, receive some of the benefits, um, and, and wait for other people to, 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 to either go Lisp or, or to try a different solution. So, this is the Lisp architecture. Um, uh, as I was saying, it is the captain control from data plane. So we have two clear uh, separated planes. On the one hand, we have we have the data plane. Here is where we have uh, end host, we have the routers, and so on. And we have the control plane, which is called the mapping system in list. And the mapping system is a distributed database. Um, you have to think about the mapping system pretty much as the DNS that we have today. So the DNS is a, is a distributed database that it is on the internet. So the mapping system is pretty similar. Then on the data plane, as I, as I was saying before, we have two different sets of IP addresses. We have EADs and we have airlocks. So airlocks, they are only used for interdomain routing. And they only make sense here in the interdomain part of the internet. While EADs, they only make sense in intradomain, inside the domains. And they are used to identify host. So, um, all, let's say that what you can think of it as all the addresses that are currently on the interdomain, they, they are somehow airlocks. While the addresses that we have, uh, that we are using today in our hosts, they are uh, EADs. Then, how, the, does, uh, how do we actually join or how do we communicate the EAD space with the airlock space? Well, we use something which is called least capable routers. So we have some routers which are least capable, which actually implement Lisp, and they are called tuner routers. Okay, so we have either ingress tuner routers or egress tuner routers. Why they have two different names? Because actually they encapsulate packets from one to another one. Okay, so um, ingress tuner, tuner routers connects the AD space with the airlock space only in this direction. It encapsulates packets and forwards them to ingress tuner routers which in turn interconnect airlock space with the EAD space, only in this direction. Then whenever a router implements both functionalities, so both ingress and egress, it's called an X tuner router. Okay? And then you have the mapping system, which is responsible of mapping EADs to a set of airlocks. Okay? So it's a distributed database that bins EADs to airlocks. If you think about it, this is very, very similar to what we have today in the DNS. The DNS maps host names with IP addresses. In Lisp, you map EADs with airlocks. So you map identities to locations. Okay? And also, they contain policy information, routing information, which is uh, actually not routing, excuse me, traffic engineering information, which is uh, why Lisp scales. And I'm going to explain this a little bit further. Okay, so I'm going to explain the life of a packet in Lisp. Okay? So we have. Um, we have the EAD space, we have uh, two hosts, host A and host B, which both of them, they have one EAD, EAD A and EAD B. And then we have two tuner routers, two list, list routers. Um, one has airlock one, and the other one has two connections with the internet, airlock B1 and airlock B2. Okay, and now I'm going to explain how a packet goes from host A to host B. Okay, so first of all, as it happens today, the internet, uh, host A will ask to the DNS, okay, please tell me which is the IP address of host B. And the DNS will reply with an IP address, which in this case we will assume or we will interpret that it is an EAD. So it will reply with EAD B. And then uh, host A will forward the packet as it happens today. So in list you don't require any change on the host. Okay, host remain as we have today. So host A will forward the packet, and the packet is a standard IP packet. So it will have as the source address, the EAD of host A, as the destination address, the EAD of host B, plus the content, which is the data from the application. And this is the IP header. OK. So whenever uh, the packet reaches the tunnel router, the tunnel router it does not know where actually EAD B is. Actually, uh, recall that you cannot forward EAD packets on the airlock space. So you need to map it. You need to know which is the locator for EADB. 
So it will send a message to the mapping system, again very similar to the DNS, which is called a map request. And it will ask the mapping system, could you please tell me where is actually EADB? Well, uh, the message will be forwarded through the mapping system until it reaches this to the router, which will reply with two air blocks. Okay? If you want to reach EADB, you can send packets to either airlock B1 or airlock B2. And on top of that, it will create, it will configure also, it will state, excuse me, not configure, state, which is the policy. The traffic engineering policies, which is, okay, in this case, I want, I have two links, uh, both of them, they have the same priority, and I want 50% of the traffic on one link and 50% of the traffic on the other link. As you can imagine, you can have different priorities, many links, or different um, weights for each link, so you can implement uh, load balancing, uh, load balancing, active backup policies, or whatever you want. Okay, so once the um, XTR, this tunnel router, knows where uh, it has to to send the packet uh, so that it reaches host B, it will encapsulate the packet and it will forward the packet to, in this case, airlock B1. Okay, so how does the encapsulated packet look like? Okay, we have here we have the original packet which is again source address EADA, destination address EADB, plus the content. Then um, you prepare a list header, which is a header which is it has some flags and some reachability information. And then you UDP encapsulate the packet actually. So you add an, a UDP header plus another IP header with the source address airlock A1, which is this router, and destination address airlock B1, which is this router, and actually this interface. So the packet will will be forwarded through the uh, airlock space, which is the core of the internet, uh, only based on this header. So you don't need to change anything on the core of the internet. They will forward packet as it is happening today, okay, uh, based on the destination address, which is the one. Eventually, the packet will reach um, will reach the the tunnel router, and what the router will do is decapsulated. So it will strip all these headers and will will only le only leave the packet, the original packet, which again has source address EADA, destination address EADB plus the data. And finally the packet will reach the destination. So this is pretty much how list works. Now, how does the a list packet look like, which is what we were discussing before. Okay, um, list packets are using UDP encapsulation, destination port 4341. Why UDP? Because it works very well with firewalls, and it is um, a connectionless protocol. Um, also, it has a zero checksum, so you don't need to compute the UDP header checksum. Why? Because you have already uh, many, many checksum on the IP addresses, on the IP headers, excuse me, on the TCP headers, if the data packet is using it to protect the packet. Um, this is how the list header looks like, and uh, it contains reachability information, which are all these flags. It also contains something which is called the instance ID, which is a 24-bit field which can be used for um, isolating or for virtual routers, VLANs, this kind of applications. And then, how does the router look like? Okay, the tunnel router does not request a mapping for each packet. Whenever it learns a mapping, for instance, through this map reply, as we have seen before, what it will do is store this mapping in a cache. So, Packets which are addressed towards the same AD, they don't have to send a map request. They are, the information is already cached on what to do. This map cache, which is called map cache, is equivalent to the RIP in BGP. So it is the information that list routers use to forward packets. So uh, basically it has AD to airlock ding dings. Uh, they operate uh, in, uh, based on the longest traffic match as any RIP. Typically they implement uh, least recently used policy, which is a very common policy for any kind of cache, and it also it includes a time to live. So each mapping includes a time to live, so that the mapping has to be expired. Uh, excuse me, the tunnel router has to expire the mapping whenever the time to live the time to time to live expires, and it has to be refreshed, so it has to send another map request. Okay, then what about the control plane? What about the mapping system? Well, as I was saying, the mapping system is a distributed database. Uh, that supports uh, f um, that supports records. Okay, 
uh, that supports these mappings. Uh, so first I'm going to, to explain how these mappings work, then I'm going to explain uh, which is the interface to a mapping system, and finally I'm going to explain a little bit, uh, very very briefly, how the mapping system works. So this is actually a list mapping, okay? So this is actually uh, the message that contains EID to airlock buildings. Okay, as I was saying, the, uh, it, the most important fields are the TTL, the TTL, so that this mapping has only a certain amount of, of, of time where it is, you can, it can, it can, it can be used, otherwise it has to be expired. Then it includes the EID prefix, and then the set of locators, okay? This is the set of locators where you actually that actually bind to this EID. Then for each locator, you can specify the priority and the weight. This is for traffic engineering uh, purposes. And finally, you have the locator, which is the IP address of the router. Um, so how this traffic engineering works? So as I was saying before, um, each mapping contains priorities and weights. So for instance, you can stating 150, 150 means that both locators have the same priority and that you want half of the traffic into one locator and half of the traffic into another locator. So this means basically load balancing. Or you can define one 100, two to 100, which means that you have an active link, which is this one, but if, link, if this link fails, then please use the second one, a backup link, which is again a very common policy in, in ISPs, in, in, in networks. It is also worth noting that um, uh, list does not only support EID ad uh, IP addresses. By means of the list canonical address identifier format, it supports uh, many other kind of formats. You don't need only you can you can map other things, uh, not only IP address to IP addresses, but you can map, for instance, MAC addresses to IP addresses. This is, for instance, relevant for layer two VPNs. And this is the mapping system interface. So the mapping system supports the following message. So the, the first message is map register, which is used by tuner routers to register a mapping. So whenever they want to register a mapping, they, use, they send the map register to the mapping system. Then the map notify message is used by the mapping system to notify a tuner router that a uh, mapping has been registered successfully. And then uh, you have two more messages, which is map request, which is used to request a mapping to the mapping system, and you have the map reply, which is used to uh, actually send a mapping to a tuner router. Uh, the map reply is not, typically is not sent by the mapping system, because the mapping system actually forwards the map request to the uh, tuner router, which is responsible for that, map, for that mapping, which in turn will send the map reply to the request. Okay, so this is what, um, which are the messages. And uh, then uh, I'm going to, to skip uh, how the mapping system works. Uh, you can uh, read the slides and follow the slides. Uh, also uh, consider the documents that uh, are cited. I think that the, all of them they are pretty self-contained. Okay, so here you have how the mapping system works with all the details. Then um, in the slides we also have information about internet working. So how does a Lisp site interoperate with a non-Lisp site? And this is used by means of proxy ITRs and proxy ETRs. Uh, then um, there are also some details about how you actually manage the map catch, because at the end the catch has to needs consistency. What happens when a tuner router uh, changes a mapping? For instance, it has a new airlock, or one airlock goes down. So it has to inform its peers about this, and this is done by means of a message which is called solicit map request, which forces the tuner router to refresh the mapping. Then uh, there are also some details about airlock reachability, which is used what happens when there is a failure on the path. Okay, so how those two routers understand that the, there has been a fa failure on the path and that they have to follow another, they have to follow a, a different path. And here is the bibliography where you can check uh, many documents that describe all the details about this. So thank you.